Valley. My name is Reverend Kaya Hartwood, and my pronouns are she, they. We're going to sing number 61 in the grave, the grave hymn. Lo, the earth awakes again. Welcome, everybody. Packets. 
uh, at this point, and we are hoping very much to start receiving uh, the rest of them back. Uh, just to give everybody an idea of where we are, I, I'm very optimistic, um, and I can tell you that at this point, we've received back 25 of our stewardship um, forms. We're expecting about 60, so we're less than halfway to the forms that we're expecting. Uh, but the good news is, is that we are over halfway to our stewardship goal. Uh, our stewardship goal this year is to um, raise pledges for $170,000 for an operating budget for next year, and we are currently just peaking under uh, $90,000. So um, if you have the opportunity to... I'm generally optimistic. <laughs> um, but um, if you uh, haven't received your stewardship form and you would like one, or if you know that it's buried in a bucket of mail at your house and would like a blank one, Carolyn or I can provide one to you. If you have questions, uh, there are lots of fun prizes uh, that we're going to be drawing for, and you still have the opportunity to earn tickets to uh, get into those drawings. So. When are we, we having that drawing? Uh, we are having that drawing on April the 9th, our Easter service, which will not be here. It will be at Sue Haswell. Sue Haswell Pavilion A. And uh, so, yeah, chat with us if you have questions about stewardship. Okay, we're changing things today. I know it's going to freak you out, but I'm warning you ahead of time. And we're going to try this for five weeks. So if you hate it, wait five weeks and tell me. <laughs> All right. Um, what's going to happen now is we're going to have a, a, a call to worship and a chalice lighting. And this morning, our chalice lighter is Robin Choke, and her mom, Jessie, are, is going to help her do that. And I'm going to read you the chalice lighting. So Robin, you can come forward, you and Jesse, you can get ready, because I know that the lighter thing is too hard for a little person to light. <laughs> All right. We are imperfect mortal beings, aware that of our that mortality even as we push it away. Found by our very complications, so wired that when we mourn our losses, we also mourn, for better or for worse, ourselves as we were as we are no longer, and as we one day not be at all. Joan Didion. Here, come on over now. Come on this side, if you don't want it. <laughs> Now all please join me in saying our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its gift. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe there's a spark of the divine in every person. And this is your chance to honor that. I want you to especially be mindful that we have new people in the congregation that you may not know. This is your big chance. If you've got your name tag on, you can go introduce yourselves and maybe they'll remember your name and maybe you'll remember their name. And don't neglect saying hi to people that are smaller. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Let's go. <laughs> I promise 
almost everybody's stewardship rooms and then I left them in the back because I'm really Jenkins moved away, though. Wasn't it sad? 
It ripped your heart. Yes, it was, replied Francis. I was sad when they moved away, but then your family moved in. I got to meet you and Jenkins and I are still pen pals. They send me letters with stories of all the amazing adventures they are going on in their new town, and that makes me happy. It makes me so happy that my heart is starting to mend, and maybe with a little time, that hole won't be there anymore. Sam, see all these patches from all the people I love? I gave them a piece of my heart, and they gave me a piece of theirs. Yeah, they don't fit together perfectly. And yes, sometimes a heart can rip or tear. I know it can feel risky to share something so important, but all these pieces remind me of the love I share with all my family, friends, and neighbors. And that is something I wouldn't want to give up for even the most perfect heart. Sam sat quietly, looking at Francis's heart for a few minutes. Can you do me a favor, Sam? Asked Francis. Tomorrow, take some time to look at the hearts you see around town and come back, and we can talk about them some more. Sam nodded and went back home puzzling over all the pieces of Francis's heart. All the next day, Sam did as promised and watched the townsfolk's hearts carefully. On the way to school, Sam saw a nurse who worked at the town's hospital and whose heart was filled with pieces from all the patients they had helped. Sam saw a farmer who had a farm stand at the farmer's market whose heart was filled with pieces from all the people she had fed and the workers she employed. Sam saw the minister at the local UU church whose heart was filled with pieces from all the people at their church. At school, Sam saw that all the teachers' hearts were filled with pieces from their students, and all the students each had a piece from their teacher. And on the playground, as all the kids played and had fun, Sam noticed each of them had pieces of each other's hearts. All through the day, and on the walk home, um, all through the day and on the walk home from school, Sam thought about all the hearts in town and what Francis had told Sam. Then Sam thought about the heart that they had hidden inside. Yes, Sam's heart was perfect, but in keeping it hidden away, Sam was also kind of lonely. And then it hit Sam. As scary as it is to risk a heart, it was even scarier to live with an untouched one. Sam ran the rest of the way home, and when Sam saw Francis in the garden, started to yell, Francis, Francis, I understand now. I looked at all the hearts in town, and they were filled with pieces of love. Yes, there's holes and tears, and that was sad. But they were all so beautiful, because every hole and tear was surrounded by love. Thanks for helping me. Sam gave Francis a big hug, and when they pulled away, Sam's heart was out where everyone could see it. And both Francis's and Sam's hearts each had new pieces. The end. So if you're joining me for religious education, please meet me at the back. And would the rest of you please sing us out with this little light of mine. Thank you. I'm gonna let it shine on our joys and sorrows and acknowledge the mutual support of our community. If you would like to share a joy or sorrow, please, if you're comfortable, come forward to the microphone and remember that our service is recorded and available publicly if you need to moderate the message accordingly. Judy and Gary Hart are not here today because Judy had a fall last night mm -hmm. and uh, she went to Scott and White uh, emergency room and her shoulder had been dislocated. It has been replaced and she's now at St. Joseph Rehab. So, think about her. Thank you. 
I want to let you all know that it's Transgender Day of Remembrance. That's why there are the multicolored, transcolored uh, cupcakes. And so we want to hold that in our hearts as we're talking about grief today. There's a lot of grief in Texas around transgender rights. Anybody else? We'll light one for, oh, sure. Come on, Carolyn. I've done that before. I have a memory that's slow to react. Um, this week, for those of you who've been members for a long time, you'll remember Pat Clear. Um, Pat is doing okay. I should say that first, so it doesn't sound like we're in trouble here. But she was in a really bad car accident in November, coming back from Thanksgiving with friends. Um, and her little Corolla saved her life, that gave up its <laughs> integrity to do that. She only had uh, a neck injury. I mean, it's a miracle that, that she's alive. I'm gonna go see her this afternoon and bring her some things, bring her some homemade bread, like John Ivy makes. Um, and ask you to, but ask you to pray for her, because she's, um, She's struggling, and she doesn't have transportation now, so that's a real hard thing. The um, insurance company decided to sue of the driver of the, it was an 18 wheel that she had. Um, so let's pray for her that things can improve, that the miracle of her life will continue. Unfortunately, outside of my high school, Arlington Omar uh, in Arlington, Texas, there was a shooting on this past Monday, and one of the two that were shot uh, has died, and it's very unfortunate that it had to happen at my school. Um, so thoughts for all of the, the students who have to go through that. Anybody else? Let's have a moment uh, to pray or just to sit and listen to your heartbeat. Thank you. The light one for all the unspoken. May we, may we remember those who have spoken, those who have named, the name, and those we hold in silence in our hearts. Well, what the teal hymnal, we're going to sing 1002, Comfort Me. There are many, many verses. <laughs> that tricky place where my glasses only work from a certain
So, this one is called Living with Grief. And uh, grief is a constant in every being's life. How many of you have lost someone? This is a subject that no one came running to church this morning to hear about. I think it is important to talk about this. It's so un-American to discuss it, but I believe that talking about it can lessen some of the pain and help us prepare for death with less fear. Can you remember the first time you encountered death? Anybody under four? Anybody under six? Anybody under 10? Yeah. The study of death is known as thanatology. It is a scientific discipline that examines death from many perspectives, including physical, ethical, spiritual, medical, sociological, and physiological, and psychological. It emerged out of the death awareness movement that started in the 1950s in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Before this time, death education happened within families and communities because most people died at home. Anybody uh, attended an in-home vigil? Since World War II, dying and death have been more remote. In the 21st century, only 20% of, Amer of Americans die at home, while 60% die in hospitals, and 20% die in nursing homes. Families have limited opportunities to care for the dying, or to be present at the death of someone they love. It has become challenging to pass on family and community values and customs relating to mourning the dead. Death doula, do you all know what that is? It's like a midwife for death, a death doula. And researcher Martha Jo Atkins says, for most of us, dying isn't something we're taught how to do. We may only be with two or three people in our whole lives who die. Yet we are perplexed and get frustrated with ourselves because we don't know more. She has a great TED talk, by the way, and she's from San Antonio, if you want to check her talk out. Because she's done all this great research and she works with families helping their, their loved ones transition, be less afraid. And she's got amazing stories that she's willing to share. So I'm going to tell you some of the things that, that she said in her TED uh, talk and in her book, which is called Signpost of the Dying. And it's actually a very hopeful book. So I hope you check it out. So um, she did 10 years of research and death doula work, helping people and their families transition from life to death. She tells stories after stories of how many people have unseen visitors 
who accompany them in their transition. So parents describe, patients describe religious figures, long dead friends, and relations who come during the patient's transitions and help with the passing. It is a surprising, calming, and hopeful book. Have you witnessed or heard such stories? I have. <coughs> Evidently, it's pretty common, y'all. So as you're getting worried about it, if all your dead relatives start hanging out, <coughs> that's a good thing. And if uh, Meg and I were discussing it yesterday at breakfast and wondering, who would you like to come? If you were passing, who would you want to see? Who would you like to help you, you know, show you the ropes, so to speak? It's a comforting thought. As you use, we usually have a memorial service, but it is described as a celebration of life, where we tell stories and celebrate what the person meant to us. This practice helps the family to see the person with fresh eyes and comforts them that their person meant so much to so many others. Here is an excerpt of a poem by Yu Yu Mary Oliver called The Leaf and the Cloud. When loneliness comes stalking, go into the fields. Consider the order, 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 orderliness, orderliness of the world. Notice something you have never noticed before, like the tambourine sound of the snow cricket, whose pale green body is no longer than your thumb. Stare hard at the hummingbird in the sun in the summer rain. Shake the water sparks from its wings. Let grief be your sister. She will wither or not. Rise up from the stump of sorrow and be green also, like the diligent leaves. A lifetime isn't long enough for the beauty of this world and the responsibilities of your life. Scatter your flowers over the graves and walk away. Be good-natured and untidy in your exuberance. In the glare of your mind, be modest and beholden to what is tactile and thrilling. Live with the beetle and the wind. Mary Oliver. I imagine that you may have heard of the seven stages of grief. We all experience them, but we don't necessarily experience them in the same order, and we may experience them in a more spiral-like fashion. It might come around. Uh, my experience of uh, grief is that it's an onioning, you know, especially at holidays or things where more family, uh, all my family passed away before I was 36. I think the last one died when I was 36. So I got a lot of practice to the point that the undertaker asked me out. <laughs> Strange but true. <laughs> so the seven stages of grief, which you probably are familiar with, I'll just go through them quickly, are shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance and hope. Now we hope we get to that one, but you may get stuck in one or another and never move out of it. What are we supposed to do to help? Now what are we supposed to do? If your friend is grieving, what do you do? Mostly nothing. Just be with them. I think the most comforting thing that I've experienced, I don't know how it is for you, but just be there or just say that you're available to be there and don't do anything. Um, I think we had that story when, when uh, story time about the rabbit listened. Do you remember that story? Well, basically, you know, everybody tries to fix it. And they try talking, and they try dancing, and they try jumping up and down or whatever, but the rabbit just listened. That's the right thing. Just be there. It's uh, one of Meg's uh, teachers when she was in CPE, which is uh, what they make ministers do, work in the hospital, be a chaplain. It's, Don't do something. Just stand there. Just be there. It's a mistake to say things like, 
you know, it happens for a reason and things like that. Don't do that. It just makes everybody mad as hell. <laughs> I'm going to just keep this off here so I can see what I'm doing. So another poet who writes a lot about grief and loss, has a book called Loss, uh, is poet Donna Ashworth. She has a whole book of poems dealing with loss, also about life. She's a, she's a helpful poet. She says, this one's called Great Grief. Don't fall out of love with the world because they are no longer, they are no longer alive in it. Instead, be grateful that this world produced them. Be glad that this life ever existed and you were blessed enough to love them then and love them still. Don't fall out of love with this world because it could not keep your heart whole. Instead, let love be the glue Patch it up and fill it with joy that you know firsthand in this bittersweet conundrum that great grief is born only of great love. That's Donna Ashworth, English poet. I don't know anything, but it seems like poetry and stories help. Tell your stories. Listen when people tell theirs. I'm here to listen if you need me. It's one of my jobs. And um, I try to do it the way you want it done. Um, I want to leave you with a story of our own uh, Reverend Meg Barnhouse called The Green After. I tried to get her to read it. Today I have too many friends who are dying. Sometimes at a memorial service I feel dissatisfied and I'm the preacher in charge. I realize I can't figure out how to preach my view of resurrection. I know that people would want to hear it I'm not worried about offending or confusing anyone. I treasure the ability to speak the plain truth as I see it. The plain truth is no one knows for sure what happens when we die. That's not a very stirring thing to proclaim at a funeral, though honest as it is. We all have some kind of belief about it, even if that belief is that there is nothing after we die. The reason I haven't preached it yet is because when I call to mind my belief about the afterlife, it comes to me as a color. At a camping weekend with friends, we were nestled in a clearing on a mountainside. Most of the folks were around the campfire talking or dozing. Our chef was in the cooking tent grilling and gossiping with his fiance and a couple of others. He wasn't wearing his high heels that day. He always grills in his life. He does sometimes, but only on camping weekends. I love those people, and they love me. Being surrounded by love is one fine way to spend time. I wandered off to the hammock and lay there looking up at the sky through early April leaves. I was soaked with light. The blue of the sky, the green of young leaves, the sun shining through them like stained glass. I thought... When I die, I want to have my ashes buried under this tree so that for one spring after another, my body can be part of this particular green. I could feel my life flowing through the cells of a leaf, feel the leaf opening to the warmth and the light, feel myself part of that green, and I was happy. If that is my afterlife, I will be deeply happy. The hope of that afterlife doesn't take any leap of faith. I know it can happen. The minerals and the water in my body can be soaked up through the roots of that tree. A part of my body will unfurl, green in the sun. My soul may be somewhere else. Sometimes I think my soul will float in an ocean of love. Will I recognize old friends, family who have gone ahead? I don't know. I think I will know they are there. I will know this. There is not now, nor was there ever, any separation between us. I will know that they were part with me the whole time, as strongly when I was alive as when I'm part of the leaves. The green of a new leaf, lit from behind with the spring sun, stays inside me. A glowing place of peace, the certainty that I will always be part of life. 
During a memorial service, I see that green. I feel that peace. It's hard to preach a color, but I'm going to think of a way. Meg Barnhouse. Thank you all for listening this morning. Now let us take an offering to sustain and strengthen this place, which is sacred to so many of us, a community of memory and of hope, for we are now the keepers of the dream. This church shares the proceeds of the offering plate donation every week to support important nonprofit organizations with which we work. This month, we are proud to support the Arlene Campbell Humanitarian Foundation, whose mission has been for some time to provide medical supplies and equipment for health facilities in Ukraine and to help facilitate training and research programs between American and Ukrainian scientists and physicians. Please be as generous as you can. So, uh, this is the saddest song I've ever heard. <laughs> it's by Slave Please and it's called Cry. Mm. New love's like a diamond, like a twinkling star. There's a whole lot of heartache to get where we are. Cause every man is a myth, every woman a dream. Watch a little heart get crushed and the truth gets in between. Every bond is a bond of sorrow, blue skies turn gray. Everything you love will be taken away. Cry for your mama, cry for your dad, cry for everything you know and never had. Lying in the bed you made, all but you were so young. Say a prayer, put your head down, gotta prove your mama wrong.
gifts we have given to those we receive and for each other. May your generosity return to you tenfold. Now, please join me in extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of the truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we gather together again. leave you with a sad song. So. <laughs> this is one of mine. It's called Hold On. And I hope that's what you'll do.
May you suffer belief in being lessened, and may you go in peace.